Today, we talk about what might just be the most interesting video game console of the 1970s, the Milton Bradley Microvision. Hi, I'm Jacob with Video Game Retrospective, and today we are looking at the first ever handheld video game console. Let's get into it. Milton Bradley isn't exactly a name you would think of when you think of video games. No, they are more likely to be brought up when discussing their ever-popular board games like The Game of Life or Candyland. But they were a very important titan of the early electronic gaming industry. They first saw success in 1978 with the massive popularity of the electronic novelty game Simon, which sold millions of units in its initial release and remains popular with new revisions to this day. Now that's not really what I'd consider a video game, but it did directly lead to them. In 1977, Milton Bradley engineer J. Smith III, who would later go on to design the Vectrex and those weird games played with a remote control through your cable box, if anyone other than me remembers those, uh, he came up with the idea of an LCD-based video game device that could play not just one game, but a ton by switching out the game's ROM chip for another. After two years of development, that device, named the Microvision, would launch with a starting price of $49.99, with game cartridges costing $19.99. The Microvision is a very odd device. One of the strangest things about it is its very odd cartridge size. Rather than using a typical cartridge like basically any other console ever released, the cartridges for the system are more like faceplates. Without one inserted, the Microvision just feels naked. And that makes sense, since oddly enough, the cartridges themselves contain most of the guts the system needs. The system itself doesn't even have a CPU. Instead, every game includes its own CPU and ROM. The machine itself is essentially just the LCD screen and its controller chip plus the keypad mechanism and an analog control knob. One of the consequences of that is that the game system itself remained fairly cheap, but additional games were quite expensive, costing almost half of what the system itself cost, meaning most owners ended up only buying one or two games for it. Most games didn't use all the possible buttons, so those that went unused were blocked off by each game's plastic shell, which I think helps simplify the learning process with the controls. Each cartridge also included an overlay that goes over the screen, adding a nice border and sometimes on-screen elements. It's a very different approach than what the next major handheld console, the Game Boy, would do an entire full decade later. The Game Boy definitely simplified the handheld gaming experience a lot, especially inserting cartridges, which proved a little too challenging for some tech illiterate microvision owners. Despite the different method of using interchangeable cartridges and the obvious size difference, you can still see the fundamental parallels between the two. In fact, the connections between the Microvision and Nintendo go further, as several different Nintendo employees have called the Microvision the primary inspiration for the development of Nintendo's Game & Watch series of handhelds. These devices, which used printed LCD character screens, exchanged the flexibility of the Microvision for better graphics and somewhat deeper gameplay. The Game & Watch series was Nintendo's first major handheld success, and without them, it's likely that the Game Boy would never have been designed as their successor. Finding exact sales numbers for the device is really hard. Looking at MB's earning reports, the best I can deduce is that it likely sold between 150,000 and 300,000 units netting a profit for MB, but overall a minor one in their extensive catalog of products. One big downside to being the first to a new market is that it's hard to bring other companies on board. Third-party game development was still a relatively new concept, but the Atari VCS was showing how vital it was to long-term success. The Microvision had exactly zero third-party games released, which is disappointing since the library is painfully small. That's right, only 12 
games were ever released for the Microvision. But it's actually worse than that, with the USA only seeing 11 of those games released. The missing title being the European exclusive Super Blockbuster. Europe actually got it worse though, with five games remaining US exclusives. Europe did get one cool consolation prize, however. While the US was stuck with beige cartridges all the way through, Europe's releases were a lot more colorful. So yeah, despite only casually picking up a refurbished console on eBay for $100 with two games and then another small lot of titles, we still have a third of the Microvision library. If these games weren't so rare and expensive, you could easily fill out the entire library. For the games we do have, there's Blockbuster, which was the pack-in game sold with the system, making it by far the most common game, which explains why we have two of them. It's a breakout clone that uses the system's paddle. The control feels silky smooth, but the critical flaw is that the game is just way, way too fast. I'm normally a breakout master, but I have never beaten a single level of this one. Next is Pinball. It's not surprising that this is a single screen, non-scrolling affair, but it's just not pinball. Really, it's just breakout again, but with four unbreakable blocks in the middle of the screen. This one is a bit better than Blockbuster in my opinion, but not by much. Next is Bowling, which is essentially just a timing game. Press the fire button at the right time to get a strike. It's probably the best Microvision game we own. And last is Star Trek Phaser Strike, a surprising license to see on the Microvision. Unfortunately, this might be the most disappointing one of them all. You move from three different fixed angles to shoot Klingon ships at the top of the screen, then repeat until the batteries die. It's far too simple. From my description, you might see the games as... disappointing. And they are. But what do you expect from a system with a 100 kilohertz processor, just 64 bytes of RAM, and a screen resolution of 16 by 16 pixels? Here's what that resolution looks like on a modern display. You don't collect this system for its amazing games or hardware specs. You collect it for its wow factor. It's a system far ahead of its time, shining the way forward to a future of much, much better handheld systems. When we give people tours of our studio, I'm always sure to show off our microvision. To shocked replies of, holy cow, it's huge, or wow, I would have loved this as a kid, or even a, wow, that thing's stupid. It never fails to get a reaction. It's devices like this that deserve to be remembered and preserved for what they did to further the video game industry, even if they aren't that incredibly fun to, you know, actually play. Unfortunately for the Microvision, preservation is getting increasingly difficult. There are several issues this aging tech runs into that need to be addressed or you'll end up with a bricked unit. The most common issue with old Microvision units is screen rot. This issue can happen with any device using LCD technology and occurs when the glue that holds the layers of the LCD together deteriorates, separating parts of the screen. This is the most fixable issue with the Microvision, since replacement screens are pretty easy to obtain. The second issue with the system is keypad degradation. The screen membrane underneath the overlays degrades after heavy use. Our system has a small amount of damage to that area. In particular, I would recommend being careful pressing buttons if you happen to have long nails, since you can pierce the panel. As far as I can tell, there really isn't a great method to fix this issue. And the biggest issue with the Microvision is that it is extremely sensitive to static electricity. A little spark from your hands to the system will kill it. This was a pretty big issue for Milton Bradley when producing the system. They had to redo a lot of their factory floor to reduce static and work to make later release Microvisions more shock resistant which they did succeed in for the most part. Thankfully, even if every single Microvision does die, we still will be able to play Microvision games thanks to dedicated fans backing up the games with full support in the MVEM emulator. You even get recreations of the game's overlays 
which is really cool. So that's the Microvision, a forgotten system that I hope you now share my appreciation for. In the end, the Microvision was a minor success, but it didn't last. In fact, it was only on sale for two years, from 1979 to 1981. Primary reason for this isn't that the Microvision stopped selling, it's that Milton Bradley wanted to focus more on their next device, the Vectrex, which was also really unique and also only sold fairly well. They're pretty similar in that regard. They're both quite underrated. Now let's get to the ratings. Rarity, 5 out of 5. Even if every single Microvision produced was still in functioning condition, this would be a pretty rare console. And we know that's not the case. Games outside of Blockbuster can also get very rare, especially if they're complete in box. Price, 2 out of 5. Prices on the system itself aren't that bad, but games do average for $20 to $50 each, which adds up. Aesthetics, 2 out of 5. While I love how unique the system's form factor is, I do have to admit that it's not that much of a looker. Games, 1 out of 5. When one of the most revered games on a system is Connect 4, you've got an issue. But nobody buys a Microvision for the game library anyways. Convenience, 2 out of 5. It's not really fair to judge this system on convenience, but I'm trying to be objective. It's kind of clunky to use, and repair time needs to be factored in, but it's still an almost portable system that can run on just a single battery. It's pretty cool. Well, that was our video on the Milton Bradley Microvision. If there's a particular rare, obscure video game console you'd like us to talk about next, let me know down in the comments below. Of course, you can also talk about this system or any other system you'd like on our Discord server. And if you'd like to keep this show running, you can check out our Patreon. So I'll see you guys next time.